So in the last couple of videos, we'll be talking about how to use um, math, pretty much, to figure out the how the population actually looks and what it actually is. You look at the LU frequencies and genotype and phenotype frequencies to actually help you describe the composition of a population. And we talked about the fact that you can even use Punnett squares to predict what happens in a future generation based on the numbers that exist on the current generation since without evolution those numbers will pretty much stay the same for the LU frequencies. But so although sex reproduction may shift the genotype frequencies and the phenotype frequencies, in other words, change the way the population looks like by recombining the genes, ultimately the LUs which are in the population are still going to be the same. You're still going to have the same composition of the gene pool of the population so there's no evolution. And we're going to be talking more about that on this video, but before we get into the actual uh, Heidi Weinberg principle and the concepts of microevolution, I wanted to clarify that evolution is going to occur in, in, within populations. It's never a, uh, a one member of the species that evolves. It's always going to be looking at the population as a whole. So to understand evolution, you have to observe two different things. You have to observe interpopulation gene differences or intrapopulation gene similarities. So think about this. Interpopulation means within a population, there's going to be a lot of variety. People within the population are not the same because there's a big gene pool, but different people will have different genes of that gene pool in them. That means there's variety within a population. Now, if there's enough variety in the population and enough differences between two groups within a population, that might lead to speciation or to a differentiation of the population and eventually to evolution. So that's an important concept. All right, if there's enough differences that cause a separation between two groups, that might ultimately lead to evolution. So it's important to understand uh, the existence of interpopulation gene differences. Likewise, to understand what's happening with evolution, it's important to understand intrapopulation gene similarity, or the idea that two separate populations might have a lot of genes in common, and that if they have enough genes in common, they can be considered the same species, and they can probably do what we call interbreeding, which is still have viable offspring that can continue to do the same. Uh, but if you see enough differences between populations like us and the gorilla population, for example, then we're no longer going to be able to interbreed and therefore we're going to be two different species which are not going to be interacting in terms of evolution. So when you study microevolution, you study population changes and you're going to study the similarity that exists between different kinds of population as well as the differences that exist within one population. And that's going to be an important concept that we have to talk about. Differences within a population and similarities between different populations are all going to be important factors in understanding how evolution actually happens. All right? Now, the idea of, of, of all of this is, like we talked in the previous video, that sexual reproduction, or the process of meiosis, including crossing over, independent assortment, and then random fertilization, will cause shuffling of the genetic code available within gene pool each member of the population has a specific genetic combination which then gets passed on by the offspring in a random process of meiosis which involved the crossing over independent assortment and then a random process of fertilization when one of the gametes of one and one of the gametes of the other randomly meets to form a new organism that will be a random combination of both parents which have random pieces of the alleles present in the population. So each time sexual production takes place, it randomizes the distribution of genes that exist within a population, like we did in the previous video, and it will change the genotype and phenotype frequencies. But it may not change the allele frequencies because all you did is you got what was already there and you shuffled it around. I think of it as getting pieces of Lego that were there and basically just changing them around and putting them in, in a different kind of construction. You don't have any new Lego pieces though, so that's not evolution. That's still the same uh, Lego pieces. You just put them in different arrangements to make a different look. Uh, and that will create uh, interpopulation gene differences, but it will not create new genes. But a different population might have the same Lego blocks, and that means it's going to be able to also co cross with your population. But if that population has enough different Lego blocks, it would be considered a different population. And that is what it leads it to become actually evolved. Now within a population, if you shuffle the blocks in a way that will create groups with completely different kinds of setups, and then with eventual separation and new mutations happening and new, new Lego blocks showing up on each of them separately, that may also lead to evolution. 
And I know it's kind of complex, but I hope that by the end of this video, so you're going to get you got the point of this. But the most important thing you should know by now is that sex reproduction is not going to create new uh, genes. It's only going to create new variations or new looks because of new combinations of genes that are already there. All right? Now, microevolution is actually changing the, the allele percentage in a population. In other words, changing the composition of a population. So, for example, we did examples of this when we talked about nat natural selection when we did the uh, evolution lecture series. And we talked, for example, a bacteria that is resistant to a drug, and then you put antibiotics on this bacterial community, everybody will die except for the bacteria that is resistant. So, in a few generations, the bacteria which is resistant is going to become more common and ultimately it's going to be the only one that's actually going to survive and so you actually change the population from a population that had more of one type than the other to a population that has that's exactly the opposite and we talked about the same thing with the moss example that you know in the middle ages the white color used to be more uh, common because because on the moss because the trees were kind of whitish so it was an advantage for the moss to hide because it was white so the black mosses were rare but after pollution caused the, the same white trees to become covered with gray material the, the white started to stand out and the black started to you know kind of uh, bland and so all of a sudden the population shifts from being mostly white moss to being mostly dark moss so that is what we call microevolution or changes in the allele frequency that exists in the population same thing with the pesticide application in, in bugs. If you have one bug that's resistant to the pesticide, it's going to be the one that survives when all the other ones die, and it's going to be survive to have more children that survive to do the same. And before you notice, all the populations of bugs are going to be resistant to the pesticide, which is why ultimately things like antibiotic and pesticides are not a long-term uh, mechanism to actually solve problems with bacteria and pests because you're actually causing this, the rise of a resistant strand in the population, you're making the population become resistant to the drug that you're actually using to kill it, you know? But that's microevolution. And what microevolution does in, is, is the opposite of what happens with sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction only shuffles the genes to create new looks, which are basically recombinations of what are already there. In microevolution, you do what is called directionality, or you fix the alleles in the population. You change the composition of the alleles towards a certain group. So you're gonna create what's called fixed alleles to things like selection, mutations, uh, random effects, and migration. And that's what we have to talk about in the terms of the Heidi Weinberg principle, which are based by two mathematicians or scientists, which look at or trying to try to understand how evolution actually happened. Now I hope you're following along with everything we said, you know, uh, and if not, review what we talked about before you go here. But anyways, the idea here is that there are several things which are going to cause things to uh, not evolve. It, look, they, they're trying to understand what, how evolution happened by trying to understand the conditions on which it won't happen. Remember that on the examples that we did in the math problems on the previous video, we talked about the fact that the alley frequencies were staying the same even though sexual production was shuffling them around because no evolution was taking place. Under what conditions will that happen? Under what conditions will the allele frequencies remain the same because no evolution is, is, is happening? So to calculate the allele frequencies in the population uh, staying the same is going to happen this. If the population is large enough, um, it's going to take forever to any change to actually take place. Let's say, for example, you have a new organism showing up in a population with a new allele, a new mutation, okay? But this is a population of 8 billion human beings. And now you have this human being who just, it's just can't get disease. He's immune to all diseases. Well, he's just one out of 8 billion. And an accident could happen to him. He could die or he could have or not have children. So the chances of his awesome mutation taking hold of a population that's 8 billion, it's going to be very, very small. But if the population only has 10 members and all of a sudden one of the members has a mutation, well, you just changed 10% of the population. So you see, the larger the population is, the less the effects of evolution will actually take place because a large population will mask the tiny, tiny effects of random variation and mutation changes. 
And that's very important. And that's why, as we have globalized communities, evolution will slow down even more because sexual production will continue to shuffle the genes a lot, but selection will go a lot slower since the population is one large population which is constantly exchanging genes. Um, another thing that slows down the process of evolution is the idea of random mating. Now, if each person in the human race had an equal chance of mating with any person of the human race, that would lead to absolutely no changes in the population because, you know, you don't have a group that's reproducing separate from another group. So, random mating makes sure that there's no separation among groups of the population. We're not selecting, we're not, you know, uh, just by choice or by random effects choosing to date with that person. But that's not usually what happens, you know, because think about it. In real life, uh, you're not going to randomly mate with someone from, from the earth. You're going to mate with someone who's close to you. You're going to mate with someone who's uh, exposed to you all the time. You're going to mate with someone you probably went to school with or you worked with or you went on a date with, which means it's probably someone that lives close to you. So there is no random mating usually in populations. But if there was, that would slow down evolution because it would not it would release the effects, random effects of things like migration or selection or anything like that. All right? So globalization, again, uh, will add to this picture. But still, evolution will still take place because people will still try to choose people that, you know, live around them. It's just kind of how it happens. I think of it as you fall in love, of course, and that seems random, but you really fall in love with someone that you meet. And that's not random. You know, you meet people which are living nearby you or that take the same path of life that you took. And it may seem random, but it's not really random because if it was, you would have an exactly the same chance of ending up falling in love with someone in America as you would have with someone in Zimbabwe. And you should know that's actually not true. So geographical, temporal, or any other kind of separation will actually cause randomness to actually be reduced. All right? And another thing that they said that would stop uh, the evolution from happening is the lack of migration. You know, because when you evolve, by, if, by definition, evolution is a change in the allele combination of a population. When migrations take place, you're going to change the population. Think about the U.S. population. This place here used to be dominated by Native American Indians, right? And that was the gene pool that they had at that time. But then all of a sudden, the migration of, of people from Europe bring a completely new set of genes into this American soil, which completely changes the allele frequency of the population. And then all of a sudden, you go from having 90, 99% uh, Native American Indians, or even 100% of that, to more like 5% of that, and then 90% European descent. But then a wave of slaves is brought from Africa, and then again, that causes a shift in population numbers in the U.S. And then, uh, you have people coming from Europe because of the Great Wars, and because of the strives that were happening in Europe, and, and things like, you know, you're going to have... Irish immigrations, Italian immigrations, you're going to have German immigrations, uh, Jewish immigration, and that will cause massive shifts of the population in the U.S. You're going to have the more recent large Hispanic immigration towards the U.S., you have Asiatic immigrations, and that will constantly keep changing the gene pool of the U.S. population. So you see how migration causes change in the population. So if you stop migration, you stop evolution because you stop the changes in the allele frequency of the population. Another big one that they also talked about is the idea of selection. Now, in selection, uh, you obviously are selecting for a specific look, and that's the driving force of evolution like we talked about in the evolution lecture series. But if you have no selection, so if you delete the selection, you're not going to have any changes taking place across generations, and that's also going to stop evolution. Finally, the source of variation is mutations. So if you stop mutations, or you have mutations, but there's no net mutations. In other words, you can still have mutations happening, but another mutation will happen that will erase that mutation, or that mutation will not take hold of the population, or it's going to be a silent mutation or something like that. If it's something like that, then it wouldn't cause evolution. So evolution happens because populations are small sometimes, because there's no random mating, because there's migration, because there's selection, and because there's mutations, all of which will cause changes in the population across time. But if you had large populations, completely random mating, absolutely no migration, no selection, and no net mutations, no evolution would ever take place. And you would be what was called an evolutionary equilibrium, which is what these graphs here are trying to uh, show you. Uh, equilibrium between the actual allele frequencies present in the population because of, of the evolutionary process that is halted. 
like we did in the math of the previous videos. Now, on the, we're going to explore this concept a little bit further on the next video. We're going to be talking about the heidi weingart formula and how they actually figured out uh, a way to predict evolutionary outcomes by looking at what causes evolution to take place.